Hello everyone. Myself, Dr. Renita Jobby from Amity Institute of Biotechnology, Amity University, Mumbai. So today we are going to talk on the topic of viruses. We'll be basically looking on to the various structures uh, in all viruses and uh, a general idea of how a virus replicates that is a life cycle. Uh, taking examples of bacteriophages. The reference for the same is the book of microbiology uh, by Tortora, Funk and Case that is the 13th edition and in that uh, you all can uh, check out the chapter 13 which has got information on viruses, viroids and prions. So what are viruses? We consider viruses as submicroscopic particles because um, they are said to be much smaller in size than bacteria. From its identification by Dmitry Vanovsky, um, who was the first one to identify the filtrable entities, which he called uh, them before, uh, that is from the tobacco mosaic virus. And later on, we had uh, Wendell Stanley who uh, studied the chemical and uh, structural properties of the purified virus. So then there is another big question that uh, comes in uh, where a lot of debate is going on among um, various scientists as to whether viruses are to be put into the category of living organisms or non-living organisms. The main reason for the same is because they cannot live outside the host. They are live or they have their properties or they are active only when they are present inside the host. Outside the host, they are completely inert. And only when they enter the host are they able to become active and are their nucleic acids also active. So that is the most important reason uh, why the debate is going on. So then how do we define viruses? So based on their property that they are able to live inside the host itself, we call them as obligate intracellular parasites because they just cannot survive without the host. And uh, mainly like all other organisms, those who have DNA as well as RNA, viruses are quite unique because they have either one of them. That is they have just only one single type of nucleic acid that is either a DNA or a RNA. Apart from that, they have a coat around itself which surrounds this nucleic acid which is proteinic in nature and sometimes there are envelopes present over the coat. And they have the ability to multiply inside the host and completely take over the host machinery. Um, not only that, viruses are said to have no enzymes at all or very few enzymes. And uh, basically, they lack all enzymes for synthesizing the protein and the uh, ATPs. So that is the reason once they infect the host, they completely take over the host metabolic machinery to produce their own enzymes. And this particular property of virus is of utmost significance because whenever people are developing any antiviral drugs, since they are taking over the host cell machinery, there is a chance that whatever are the antiviral drugs, they can uh, also target the functioning of the host. And uh, thereafter, you have several problems that do results, that do result because of such kind of antiviral drugs. And they can become toxic for use as well. Coming to the host range, it basically tells us that which all organisms or what is a spectrum or of the host cells that the viruses can infect. So basically we know viruses which can infect invertebrates, vertebrates, plants, animals, protists, bacteria, just almost everything. But the one most unique property of most of these viruses is they are they're very specific to the host species. So if I say that a virus is uh, probably able to infect a cat, so there is a very quite less chance that that virus that infects the cat will go and attack a dog also. At least most of the viruses. So they do not cross the host species barrier. 
except for certain viruses which have gained the ability to cross the host species barrier. One live example that we are seeing of today is of uh, COVID-19. And uh, basically, we'll be talking about uh, uh, li uh, the life cycle of bacteriophages. Bacteriophages are basically called as the viruses which have the ability to infect bacteria. Now, the host range uh, or as uh, we can say the uh, uh, type of uh, organism the virus is able to attack is basically de determined by the uh, virus requirement. Like it should have a certain requirement of attaching to a certain cell. Only then it can it, it would be able to penetrate the host. And the availability in the host of certain factors which will help the virus to multiply inside also. So as I said, there is something that is there on the surface of the host which are called as the receptor site to which the virus will go and chemically interact. That is the first step, that is the attachment that takes place. This interaction is basically by weak bonds that is hydrogen bonds and uh, once the attachment takes place there is this strong association that is created between the host cell and the virus common examples of sites of attachment include the cell wall the flagellate the fimbriae in case of animal cells the plasma membrane uh, because of the specificity or you can say the narrow range to which the viruses will go and infect has uh, given a lot of interest to using the virus to treat infections. So basically this phenomena is called as phage therapy and this has been practiced long also. Uh, it was first developed in France in 1919 and thereafter it was also used up to 1979. It is currently being researched on in Russia, Georgia and the United States. So specific, uh, specifically, people are trying to look on to antibiotic resistant uh, bacteria, and since the antibiotic resistant bacteria are highly resistant to most of the antibiotics that are there, so they are trying to check if phage therapy can be applied to treating such uh, drug resistant organisms. Not only that, a uh, lot of um, research is going on. In understanding the role of bacteriophages that are present in the human microbe, they say that all the bacteriophages that are present in the human microbes are also responsible for maintaining the health by, uh, uh, you know, uh, basically uh, attacking the pathogenic organisms which gain entry. So that is again one field of uh, research that is presently going on. Coming to viral size, they vary a lot. They can be very small smaller than the bacteria or they can be uh, larger in size that is from 20 to 1000 nanometers could be the length. So this is a pictorial representation of how our human blood cell looks and in comparison to the human blood cell how the E. coli bacterium uh, varies in size to the chlamydia uh, bacteria which is just around 300 nanometers. And these are the different types of viruses which we have shown, uh, they have shown a different uh, uh, range in sizes starting from the Ebola which is 970 nanometers up to bacteriophages which is just 24 nanometers. So you can see, imagine how small the bacteriophage MS2 is when compared to your, the RBCs as well as E. coli. Now coming to the viral structure, virion is a term which is uh, used to describe a complete viral particle. So when I say uh, uh, it's a complete viral particle, it basically means that it is composed of your nucleic acids and the protein coat that is either your DNA or RNA and a protein coat that is outside. And based on their nucleic acids, there is a classification of viruses involved as you have double stranded, single stranded and based on the structure of the codes also. So we'll see ahead how the different st code structures are present. According to that also the viral classification is carried out. Coming to nucleic acid. So as I said earlier, it will either be a DNA or it will be an RNA. It can be single stranded or double stranded. So you can have a double stranded DNA. You can have a single stranded DNA. 
you can have a double stranded rna or you can have a single stranded rna also not only that they can either be linear or they can be circular or else they can be segmented also for example influenza is a uh, seg has got a segmented nucleic acid the percentage in terms of the nucleic acid and proteins can also vary depending on the size of the virus that is it is about only 1% in influenza virus to 50% in certain bacteriophages and the total amount of nucleic acid can vary right from a few thousand nucleotides to 250,000 nucleotides. Now coming to the uh, capsid and the envelope. So as I said there is a protein coat which is there if this is the nucleic acid there is a protein coat that surrounds the virus which is basically for protection. So this protein coat is called as the capsid and uh, the structure of the capsid uh, is determined basically by the nucleic acid components that are there and each capsid is composed of protein units. So as you can see in this case there are different proteins uh, units that is making up this whole capsid structure and these protein units are called as capsomeres. So you can have capsomeres which can be of a single protein. So this is an example of capsomere of a single protein or else you can have capsomeres which can be of different protein also. And the arrangement of capsomere uh, is very typical for a particular virus that as, as I said it is also uh, used in the classification of the viruses. Not only that you can also have um, certain viruses wherein the capsid is seen to be covered with an envelope and this envelope is made up of lipids, proteins and carbohydrates. So this is one example of an enveloped virus which is an influenza virus. So as you can see you have your nucleic acid over here, you have your capsomeres and you have an envelope coat which is there. This is the envelope coat that is there and uh, in case of certain animal viruses uh, after infection when the virus is being released from the cell it is through a process called as extrusion. So in extrusion basically what happens you have your animal plasma membrane and this is the virus that is there and this virus will come out or bud off from this plasma membrane and during the process it will take a part of the plasma membrane of that particular host as an envelope. So that becomes the viral envelope and in this cases also it can happen that the material is derived from the host cell but you can have certain proteins which is there on the envelope which is of viral origin. So basically these can be spikes so certain enveloped prote um, uh, viruses can also have something called a spike that we just saw in over here. This is an example of influenza virus where you can see these spikes that are there which is a carbohydrate and a protein complex which projects out of the surface of the envelope. These spikes are basically useful for the host cell to attach themselves. They are also a reliable identification characteristic for these viruses. Not only that, they also have a role in clumping off the RBCs which is again useful because uh, uh, this particular uh, clumping is used in for uh, several laboratory tests. This process is called as hemagglutination wherein the RBCs and the viruses bind together and result in this clumping. Then uh, we can have viruses whose proteins are not covered by the envelope. These are called as non-enveloped viruses. And in this case, the capsid of these non-enveloped viruses is what plays a role in protecting the nucleic acid from the nuclease enzyme. And the capsid is the one which is responsible for attaching to the host cell also.